Thanks, Steve. Good to be out of Maryland. <laughs> Looks like uh, it's a different world here. It really is. Uh, I came in and everybody was running off to shake my hand and hug me, and I was like, I just went, went for it, so uh, I'm all in now. So uh, my wife's going to be upset when I get home because she told me to be careful out here. But uh, hopefully she's not watching right now. Let me drink a little water here. I've got a lot to talk about, so I'm going to get right into it. And I've got my folks up top there who are going to keep me hopefully on my time. And uh, I'm going to talk today, interesting what we heard in the sermonette, interesting what we heard in the intercessory prayer. It touches on some things I'm going to get into. And what I'm going to get into is the subject of spontaneous healing. Now, what is spontaneous healing? So spontaneous healing is someone who, let's say, has pancreatic cancer or someone who is suffering from some dreaded disease, all of a sudden, out of the blue, they no longer have this cancer. It is diminished to a great degree, and finally it is eradicated. And they go on to live five years, ten years, fifteen years, when they were given a death sentence by a doctor. Now here's the thing about spontaneous healing. Some folks who are spontaneously healed are very faithful and believe in the God of this Bible. Some other people who are spontaneously healed don't believe in this Bible, don't believe in this God. Interesting, there's a tension there, and I'm going to get into some ideas around that based upon a book I read recently, one of the best books I've read in the last five years, and the title of it is Cured by Jeffrey Rediger. Now, Rediger grew up in a very Christian home as a child, and uh, he's changed his view on things, but he has done a lot of research on the subject of spontaneous healing over the last 10, 15 years or so, and I want to deal with some of the data that he's brought forward. Let me begin by saying this. There are many case studies in his book about people who were spontaneously healed. Let me give you one example. A lady named Claire in 2008 was 63 years old. She was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Most people don't live beyond five years with pancreatic cancer. She was going to move to Hawaii from Portland, retire to Hawaii. She's diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. There's something called Whipple surgery. People who get pancreatic cancer, if you go through this surgery, you have a chance of maybe living five years. What does the surgery entail? It entails removing part of your pancreas, your gallbladder, part of your intestines. It's a very rough surgery. Many people don't recover well from it. Here's what she did. She decided, if I'm going to die, I'm just going to live. I'm just going to live to the best of my ability now that I see death in front of me. Death confronted her at that moment, age 63. She really didn't think about it too much before that. But when she was confronted with death, her mindset changed. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I wanted to give you her case study because we'll be going back to her throughout this sermon. What happened to Claire was she decided not to go to the hospital anymore. She didn't get any more checkups. And a few years later, she had to have a CT scan for something different from pancreatic cancer. So this is about two or three years later, she goes to get this CT scan. She's clean. There is no cancer anymore. That's what I'm talking about when we discuss spontaneous healing. Now, I'll get back to Claire a little bit later, but let me talk about Rediger's research. There have been over 3,500 cases of what I'm defining as spontaneous healing that have been written up in 800 medical journals since 1993. 3,500 cases since 1993 in medical journals. I'm sure there are other cases of it, but I'm talking about that have been scientifically investigated and doctors are confirming that these people got healed and I don't know how it happened. Okay? Now keep that in mind. Again, my question today is, is it all related to belief in God and faith? 
And if it's not all related to that, what else is going on here? And I'm going to get into that question. This is a speculative sermon. Hear me right at the front. It's a speculative sermon, okay? I'm not making any new doctrine here or anything like that, but I'm going to deliver information that will make you think about the subject of spontaneous healing. Now, Rediger addresses four major pillars that all of these people who were spontaneously healed had in common. They all had something that kind of got their immune system kick-started. They all did something different about their nutrition. They all did something different that had them dealing with stress in a different way than they previously dealt with stress. And the final thing, the biggest thing, was this. They changed their identity. They changed who and what they were, or at least who and what they were in their own mind how they looked at themselves and interpreted themselves in relation to the world. That was the biggest point he made throughout this book. And when we say that in this faith community, what are we thinking about? Repent and get baptized. That relates right to what Rediger was talking about by a change in identity. But let me go further here. Let me f start with the immu immune response. The immune response. How do we deal with our immune systems? In the 1800s, a Dr. Coley found this out. He had two pa cancer patients. One died of cancer, same type of cancer, that another person had who overcame the cancer. What was the difference between these two patients? After surgery for cancer, one of them got a bacterial infection, and their immune system kicked into high gear, and destroyed the cancer in their body. The other person did not have an infection after surgery, and they died of that cancer. So what Coley learned was our immune system is very powerful. If it is being used to the optimum level, it can get rid of a lot of the problems we have around disease. But in the 1800s, what the medical community was doing is they were focusing on chemotherapy and medication eradicate the bacteria in the body, kill that with medicine, use chemotherapy, destroy the bad things in there. But in destroying the bad things, we sometimes destroy some of the good things. So it's a very complex subject, but that's when this idea of the immune system being a powerful resource to overcome disease came into vogue, but it wasn't until the 20th century that we began to use it more for some types of cancers. According to some estimates, 80 to 90 percent of our diseases come upon us due to our environment, whether it is what we eat, what we drink, pollution that comes into our, into our uh, bodies, uh, smoking, drinking too much, those types of things. Our environment causes 80 to 90 percent of our disease, according to some. According to some, yes, there are biological reasons, genetic reasons why we get diseases. But if it is that high, what Rediger is trying to say in this book is we can do more work to try to stop disease. Do you know what animals do when they get sick, when they get a fever? They try to find a location that's even warmer. What do the animals know instinctively? That that heat, that fever is fighting that infection inside of their body. They know that intuitively. God has put that into them. That getting back to the immune response here. Studies that have been conducted on animals prove that when pathogens are put into animals, their immune cells can be kicked into high gear and they can destroy those pathogens by various manipulative means. According to doctors, the immune system connects to our nervous system. So all your emotions, all your thoughts, Everything that's going on up here in the mind relates to what happens in your body, ladies and gentlemen. We've learned more and more about that in the last 20 years. There are not just neuroreceptors in your brain which connect to your nervous system. There are neuroreceptors in your gut. There are neuroreceptors throughout your body. There is a communication system running throughout your entire body from your brain where the spirit of man resides, 
where God's spirit can connect with that spirit in man, and that communication system goes throughout the entire body. Think of the implications of that for a moment. Think of the implications of that for a moment. The immune system to the nervous system. It's like walkie-talkie was how Rediger described it. And have you ever heard people say, I got a feeling in my gut. I just got a feeling about that. I'm feeling something here. That's because you do feel something here, folks. You do feel things in your gut. You do feel things in your heart. Because that communication system that God has created, the amazing God that we worship, He's created a communication system throughout your entire body at the microscopic level. You can't even see it. Everything is so small. But it is like a little city in every cell in your body. It's unbelievable when you study how we've been put together. And it can all communicate with itself. Another uh, word that he brought up in the book was your microbiome. This is all of the bacteria inside your body and on the outside of your body, which is all connected to this communication system that I'm talking about. 80% of your immune system cells are in your gut. 80% are in your gut. When you take antibiotics, and again, there are times we need to take medicine. Don't hear me wrong here. I get that. But when you take antibiotics, folks, it does some good things for you, but it does some bad things for you. Here's the bad thing that it does. It eats up the library in your gut that communicates with your immune system on how to fight various diseases. If you don't need those antibiotics, if you don't have to have that medication, be, be careful with it. But I know some of us do need medication, so please hear the balance I'm bringing here in this message. Now, just I wanted to make sure you understand how important the immune system is to the whole process of healing. Point number two, all of these individuals who had spontaneous healing did something drastically different about their nutrition. They changed their diet very radically. Now, Claire got into whole foods, fruits, vegetables primarily, whole grains, a little bit of meat. She still had some pizza once in a while because it made her happy. She still drank some coffee once in a while because it made her happy. So again, balance, folks, but she drastically changed her diet. All of these individuals, case study after case study, these people drastically changed their diet. One of the biggest studies ever done on cancer was conducted in China. The reason it was conducted in China is genetically the Chinese are very similar, very homogeneous uh, population and the largest population in the world. Great place to do a study on cancer because they don't move around too much. They kind of stay where they were born. They did a huge study there, biggest study ever done on cancer. What they found was the Western diet, where it was used in China, compared to a more basic diet, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, more of that than fats, that the people who got more cancer were the people in the Western-style diet. Now, again, I'm not speaking about everybody or everything. I'm making generalities here. Some people can eat terribly their entire lives and they live to be 90. I get it. Some people smoke their entire life and they live to be 90. But, but, let's be honest. The research is there that smoking is going to cause inflammation in your body. Bad food is going to cause inflammation in your body that makes it more difficult for the immune system to fight for you. We know what it says in Leviticus 11. We know what foods we're not supposed to eat. Pork is the worst kind of meat you can eat if you compare it to the other meats that we're allowed to eat. That is research data. You can prove that. And let me add one thing more to the mix here. Many of these people in Rediger's book went to what are called Brazilian faith healing centers where they were given special diets similar to the diet I'm describing that's, that's better for you and it's made some changes in some folks. I'm going to get to the Brazilian healing centers in a moment and who these 
Brazilian faith healers are also, which is kind of shocking when you uh, begin to study on them. But here's what I mean about inflammation and nutrition. My cat cut me the other day, scratched me in, on my stomach. So that's inflammation, but that's acute inflammation. It's a one-time deal. So I put a little alcohol in there. It felt a, a little burning sensation. Why? Because your immune system goes to that location to fight against what has just happened to the body. So that's why it hurts. That's why you see the redness. That's why you feel the pain a little bit. That is what we call inflammation, acute in inflammation, a one-time thing. What happens when we eat a high-sugar diet on a regular basis? Now, I'll have a Coca-Cola once in a while. I really like a Coca-Cola, okay? Let me be honest with you. But if I have a Coca-Cola two days in a row, I start saying, danger, danger, watch out, Mike. That was two days in a row. Be careful. That's what goes on in my head. I don't know what goes on in your head, but I'm watching that sugar intake. Why? Here's what science tells us. Cancer loves sugar. Cancer eats it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Cancer loves sugar. The more sugar you're putting into your body, if you have cancer, not a good idea. Keep that in mind. That inflammation from foods can cause your immune system to work much harder to eradicate the inflammation. So when we eat too much fatty food, too much sugar, smoke, drink too much, we're causing inflammation in the body. The immune system has to work harder to eradicate that inflammation. You don't want your immune system working harder. You want it working smarter. You want it working smarter. Now, let me move on to the third point he made, stress. This is very important when it comes to your immune response. Stress also causes inflammation in your body. We need some stress. You need some fight or flight reaction to get out of the way of a car, to uh, decide whether I should go here or go here based upon who's over here or over there. You get what I'm saying. But here's the problem with fight or flight. If you stay in that mode, if your body stays in that mode on a regular basis, you lead to inflammation in the body through the release of hormones in your body. Those hormones then affect your cells and they do damage to your cells if the hormones continue to flood the cells for long periods of time. Numerous animal studies have shown this. Blood flow, clotting, heart rate, breathing, and more are affected by our reaction to stress. Affected by our reaction to stress through the voluntary nervous system and the involuntary or autonomic nervous system. So when I say I'm going to stoop down like this and stand up like that, that is my voluntary nervous system. I have control of that, okay? There's a lot of things your voluntary nervous system controls. Your autonomic nervous system deals with your blood vessels, deals with your heart rate, deals with glands in your body, deals with the functioning of organs in your body. You don't consciously think heart beat, beat heart, beat heart, beat heart, right? You don't think lungs, breathe in, breathe out. Now sometimes you do that, okay, breathe in, breathe out. But you get what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is some of the things in your body are controlled by your subconscious mind. And traumas we've experienced, bad things that have happened to us, can affect how that relates in the communication system throughout the entire body. Here's the problem with stress. You want to toggle back and forth between fight or flight and then when you're safe, you want to come into rest and digest, okay? It's fight or flight, one light switch, and then the other way for the light switch is rest and digest. You want to toggle back and forth. If you stay in fight or flight, you're doing damage to your body. Here's how the damage occurs. In all of your cells, you have something that looks like plastic at the end of shoelaces. It's called telomeres. As telomeres fray, just like your shoelace plastic, your cell starts to dissolve and go away. You want to keep those cells functioning as long as you can, so what is used is an enzyme called telomerase. Telomerase allows the telomeres to live longer, sustain a longer period of time. What knocks telomerase out of whack? Stress. 
the stress response can fray the telomeres which deal with your cell's integrity. It all works together, folks. It's an amazing invention that God has created here. Now, saying all that, what did these people do who had spontaneous healing around stress? They all began to meditate. They all were meditating in some way or fashion. And what is that? That's a focus of the brain in a particular direction. Now, all of them were not believers, but... It seems like the meditation worked for those who had the spontaneous healing. Now, there are scriptures in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says what? Pray without ceasing. I'm not going to go to all these scriptures because of my time. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. Joshua 1.8, meditate on the law day and night. Joshua 1.8, meditate on the law day and night. And I could give you a number of other scriptures that say what? Pray to God. Connect with God. That spirit in you from God. Connect. Get plugged into God. His law, day and night. That obedience that, that we heard about earlier. you got to get plugged into that source, that power source that can then work on the microscopic level of the body, the quantum level. We're talking quantum matter within your body at the infinitesimal microscopic level. What happens at the quantum level in matter? It operates differently than it does at the macro level. What you're seeing me do here, jumping up, moving like that, if we were in the quantum world right now, if we miniaturized ourselves to that infinitesimal level, I could leap tall buildings in a single bound. I could do amazing things that I can't do right now. It's weird how matter is. It'll blow your mind when you start to read this stuff. And to me, that just fits right in with who made it all and created it all. But back to where I was here on the meditation. Again, Something all of these people did who got spontaneous healing is they all began to focus and meditate on positive things, a different mindset. And they got rid of that old identity that they used to live by because they were facing death. And that changed how they operated. Again, death will change you, folks. In more ways than one, okay? It will change you. The thought of it will change you. And why does God talk about death so much? He says, get, get real here, folks. You're going to die. I'm the only way. When I got that, it changed me. It altered this brain, this mind up here, folks. Now, the major point that he made in the book, the major thing that all these people had was a major change in perception and outlook. A major change. What did Claire do? Claire went on trips with her best friends to vacation spots and just lived it up and had fun. And she let go of the past, okay? She got over the fact that she used to argue about petty things and worrying about this and worrying about that. Once she realized death was there, she let that all go. She let it go. Are we letting that stuff go as Christians? Throughout this book, it tells you, let it go. Leave the past in the past. Look forward to that kingdom. That is your focus. Are you still holding on to all the stuff in this world which will pull you back down? It'll pull you back down. Listen to what she said. I wasn't trying to save my life, just trying to live well. I wasn't trying, don't hold on to this life, Scripture tells us. And when you don't hold on to this life, you get the real life, don't you? Isn't that what Scripture tells us? No doubt it does. Another story, very quickly, a guy named Matt Ireland, brain tumor in his 20s. In his 20s, brain tumor like John McCain had, geoblastoma. He's a death sentence, the doctors told him. You're going to die, buddy, in five years. Figure it out. you got five years to live. He went down to the Brazilian healing centers. He's laying in his room one night, and he has a vision or a dream. He wasn't sure what it was, he says. 
and a woman comes out of the bathroom bathed in light and lays her hands on his head and he said he felt like God had touched him at that point. And from that moment on, his perception of his existence changed. Now again, I'm not going to get into what that was, but I'm going to tell you more about the Brazilian faith healers in a moment that's going to scare you, okay? So he went back to Vermont. He didn't get a check, a brain scan for 18 months. He goes into the doctor 18 months later. Doctor's like, what's going on, man? Where's your cancer? It was barely there. And his friend said, you better go back to Brazil. Now, again, I don't suggest that for you, but his friend told him to go back, and he went back. He met a woman there. He fell in love. They got married. They have two kids. It's been 15 years since he was diagnosed with brain cancer. What about love? What about love? When we're in a loving, accepting relationship, think about your relationship with God, which should be your ultimate relationship. When we're in a loving, accepting relationship and we know it and we feel it, oxytocin, a chemical inside of you, is released in the body from the vagus nerve up near your carotid artery. Again, that communication system. On a regular basis, the vagus nerve sends messages throughout the body to the heart, to the gut. I'm I'm in love with God, you know, I'm connected to God, I'm okay with God, God's okay with me, I've got my relationship, that is communicated through your body, through chemical means, by how you're thinking about yourself. What I'm saying about Mr. Ireland here is his relationship with this woman, he connected with her because she had gone through similar things in her life. Her brother had died of what he had. Her father had died of cancer. And there was a connection there that made them feel like they were two peas in a pod. And that may have had some connection to what messages his vagus nerve was now transmitting through his entire body. What does research tell us about loneliness? What does it tell us about social isolation? That people who suffer from loneliness and social isolation... So listen to what I'm saying, church. Make those phone calls, send those letters, connect with people. People who suffer from loneliness and social isolation, research tells us they have more heart attacks and strokes. Now, keeping in mind this change of who and what you are, I want to address some interesting things now. Right here in Cleveland, Ohio, do you guys know you have a faith healer in this vicinity? His name is Dr. Nima. He's a Catholic doctor. You may not have heard of him, but he's addressed in Rediger's book. Rediger went and checked this guy out. He, he talked to him. He interviewed him. The guy worked on his back, and amazingly, he said his back feels great right now. Okay? Well, you can find him on YouTube. Dr. Nima, N-E-M-A-H. I believe he's a Pakistani uh, Roman Catholic doctor living in the Cleveland area. Many people have said they've been healed by Dr. Nima. Rediger has confirmed that some of these individuals have experienced a spontaneous healing. Again, not all of them, but some of them have. Now, they say this about Dr. Nima. This is what they have to say about him. They feel that he's a conduit to God for them. In other words, they have faith in Dr. Nima's ability to be a conduit for faith or of faith for them to God. That's what they believe when they go to see him. Now, what does the Bible say about faith? You guys know, you've seen the scriptures. Let me just mention a couple of them. Mark 10 and 52. Now, I believe we have to have faith in the God of the Bible. Don't don't hear me wrong up here. I'm just presenting information, okay? But Catholics do believe they have faith in the God of the Bible. We have a different perception of that in our understanding of the Bible, okay? But notice Mark 10, verse 52 for a moment. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. 
And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Matthew 9 and verse 22. Matthew 9 and verse 22. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Luke 17 and verse 19. Luke 17 and verse 19 says the following. Luke 17 and 19. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. So we know what faith is. Hebrews 11 verse 1. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things hoped for. The substance, there's something to it, of something you're hoping for. The evidence of things not seen. So we can have religious spiritual faith that God can heal, but other people can have faith, can't they? What is their faith? I don't know. I don't know, but they believe what faith is also. They believe this doctor is a conduit for them. Is there something in that belief they have that kickstarts their immune system for those that it did work for? I don't know. I'm just throwing the question out there. Because not everybody gets healed. Not everybody gets healed that we pray for either, right? In fact, most of the people I've prayed for, and I've prayed pretty hard, have not been healed. I've heard some stories of some healings. I have. But most of the people I've prayed for have not been healed. That's why healing is such a controversial, debatable subject within the faith community. But hopefully, listen to the rest of what I have to say here. Maybe we can get some ideas about this. Now, I'm going to go off the reservation here for a moment, okay? Again, this is a speculative sermon. Just just because Bill said, no, I'm just kidding. But listen to what I have to say right now, based upon everything you've heard thus far. There's an experiment in quantum physics called the double slit experiment. So again, we're dealing with matter at the smallest level. And when they study it, they see some amazing things that do not happen at the level in which we experience matter. Remember, we're all matter. I'm matter. You're matter. This is matter. But at the smallest constituent level, Level of matter, the quantum level, it's a different world, folks. It is a different world. But here's the thing. It's still matter. It's still inside of you. It's still inside of me. Now listen to this experiment. I can't get into all the details. It's on YouTube. Look it up. Five-minute videos, nine-minute videos. It talks all about it. Here's what they discovered in this experiment. When they study matter at its smallest level and they observe the matter, the matter operates differently. Let me repeat. Matter can operate differently depending on the observer and how the observer is observing the matter. Do you get the implications of what that is saying, if that is true? And physicists have done experiment after experiment after experiment that prove this to be true, what I'm saying to you right now. It's called the observer effect in quantum physics. If matter is altered by observation, now I know we're just dealing at the quantum level, could that have an implication in healing from this standpoint. If we change our identity and become Christians, and now we got the Holy Ghost, as they say. You get what I'm saying? We've altered our mindset. Who observes your life? Who's conscious of what you're doing every day? You get what I'm saying here? You're observing your life. You're deciding to do this or to do that or to think this, or to think that. You are the observer of your life. 
Remember what I said about the communication that runs through your entire body. That body is connected to matter at the quantum level. Do you get the possible implication here? If you are completely focused and faithful and tuned in, what can you do as you connect with God's Holy Spirit in relation to your body and what is happening in it? Just something to think about. I'm not tying anything together here. I'm just throwing this out there as to what the observer effect says in quantum physics. Now, there's a lot that still needs to be looked at there, but I'm getting to the Spirit of God in you connecting with your brain and whatever spirit is. We don't completely understand it. Then having some effect throughout your body because your body is made up of quanta, of matter at the microscopic level. Now, let's talk a little more about healing that identity. Healing that identity. Claire described it as getting right with herself. Another individual said, I surrendered to a new way of seeing and experiencing myself. Another woman said, I changed my relationship with myself and the world. And this was a woman who was a former Mormon, came up in a strict family with high standards. She was the rebellious one. She was the one that always got into trouble. She had a kid when she was 18. She had a couple marriages that failed. She got bitten by a tick when she was a kid and in her 20s and 30s found out that it was Lyme disease and then had massive doses of antibiotics. When she got into her 40s, she had a huge growth on the side of her neck, which was cancer. They told her, you're going to die. You're going to die about from this. Get your things in order. She started to contemplate her entire life at this point, tried to figure it all out. And she's in yoga class one day, and she realizes all of a sudden she has one of those intuitive moments. The little light bulb went off over her head. She used to think of herself as a defective person growing up in this strict Mormon family where she didn't follow the rules. So the mindset of her parents was, you're defective, you're messed up. And what she tried to do the rest of her life was prove them wrong. I'll show you. I'll make more money than all of you. I'll take care of my son and raise him on my own. I don't need a man to help me do this. And she realized that in her 40s, that she'd been living from that story her entire life. That was her story. What's our stories, folks? We all got them. We all got our own stories. We all been a little screwed up over the years. Okay? And we start living from a story. But here's the deal with your story. You made it up. You made it up. It doesn't have to be reality. It doesn't have to be reality. Because this can be your reality. You get what I'm saying here? You're connecting the dots with me. Yeah, the tumor shrank, folks. They did a case study on this woman. She figured it all out, and this huge mass just disappeared like that. Just like that. It doesn't happen all the time. But it does happen. There is a brain-body connection. What neuroscience has discovered over the last 10 years is something called the default mode network. The default mode network. What is it? They describe it as the black box inside of you that keeps a record of all your experiences through your life. And subconsciously, you access that black box as you go through the day, and you interact with people. And what you're thinking subconsciously and how you're acting has a lot to do with all the experiences of your life. Here's the problem with the bad box. Just like airplanes, sometimes they crash. Sometimes they crash, and they tell the story in that black box. But I want you to think about the black box like this. 
what is the spirit in man? What is the spirit in man? The spirit in man has your memories, your emotions, your experiences connected to it. In some way, I don't have all the details, but we know in some way this DMN that the neuroscientists are talking about touches upon the spiritual self in man. Now, how did they discover the black box in us? They were doing a study in San Diego, California, Kaiser Permanente, the big health care group. They were creating a weight loss clinic. You know all these health care groups, they do different things, how to stop smoking, how to do this, how to do that. This was to overcome obesity for women. A lot of these women started losing weight. And then all of a sudden they dropped out of the program. And they were like, what's going on? They're having success. Why are they dropping out of the program? So they started calling these women up to try to figure out what's going on here. Why are they leaving the program? Make a long story short, due to time, here's what they discovered. And hear me out. I'm speaking in generalities here. I'm speaking in generalities here. Here's what they discovered. The reason these women were dropping out was because now that they'd lost all this weight, they were being hit on by guys. They were being complimented about their loss of weight. And it scared them. Why did it scare them? Again, speaking in generalities, these women, a large majority of them, had been sexually abused as children. And they took on obesity as a cover to escape what had happened to them. And you know what the doctor said? What about other trauma? What about other traumatic events in life? And they started to look at other traumatic events that people experience, from psychological abuse to physical abuse to sexual abuse, all kinds of things. And you know what they found? This is what they found that helped them start to discover or come up with this idea of the DMN, that lots of people make lots of bad decisions in life because of the black box in their head. In order to escape these bad things that have happened to them, what can kids do at eight or nine? Kid's eight or nine years old. He doesn't know what's going on in the world. How does he react to abuse? In all kinds of ways, with all kinds of bad decisions, whether it's smoking, drinking, drugs, the wrong types of relationships. And until you figure it out, like Marie did, when she's in her 40s, and she realized the story she'd been telling herself all those years, she got a hold of what she could do with the rest of her life. Stress and trauma can rewrite your DNA, folks. You can pass that DNA on generationally to others. These are amazing things that are being discovered by science today. Your DMN is a blueprint of who you are. It's not all of who you are, but it is a blueprint of your negative stories that you may have been telling yourself. It's like the desk in school. Remember the desk in school? You'd see the person who'd write with a pencil on that desk over and over every day, and that ingrained pencil mark would get deeper and deeper in your desk. I had some desks like that at school. That's what we do with our mind. We have these stories due to trauma that we've experienced, and we ingrain that record in our brain deeper and deeper until it puts us into distress and affects our very health. Now, what do you do about your DMN, your black box, or the spirit in man? you got to change what's happening in your life. you got to do things differently. And how do you do that? Well, Ephesians 4 makes it very plain and simple. Ephesians chapter 4, let's take a look at it. Notice what it says, Ephesians 4 verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Alter your thinking. Take on Jesus Christ. Repent and be baptized. Change who and what you are. 
to get rid of that story that has been your life up until that time. I'm not going to go there, but Acts 2.38 says what? Repent and be baptized. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says what? If in Christ you are a new creature, the old is gone. This fits hand in glove with what the neuroscientists are saying about getting yourself together. We're saying it in a different way. The ultimate power is with God. You can do something in this life without Him in a physical sense, but that's not going to get you eternal life, folks. We want to be connected with God because He can overcome everything here and take us into that next life. The neuroscientists and the psychiatrists and the psychologists and the medical doctors, they can do some good for you on this physical plane, but they can't give you eternal life. That is what it is all about, folks. Philippians 3.13, pressing to what is ahead, letting go of what is behind. Ephesians 6, 1 through 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual forces. Aha. Spiritual forces is what we also battle against in this life. Not just ourselves, Sometimes it's tough enough just dealing with all the stuff you've put in your own mind. There's a spiritual force out there that's trying to mess with us also. And that gets me to what we're going to say about the Brazilian faith healers in a moment. But before I say that, I want you to think about this as an analogy. I don't agree with what Cortez did when he came to Mesoamerica. Okay, He brought disease, millions of... Mexicans died, they, they destroyed the Aztec Empire, but here's what he did. Use this analogy in relation to your Christianity. When Cortez and his men got off their boats, there weren't too many of them. The Aztec Empire was the most mighty empire in Mesoamerica. Millions of people. And Cortez said, burn the boats. Burn the boats. We're either going to take the city or we're dead. We're taking the city or we're dead. Totally different mindset. That mindset that I got to do this or it's over can change how you live your life. If you know you're a king and a priest in God's kingdom, if you know it and believe it, you operate differently in this present life. Are you operating like Cortez and his men? in relation to your Christianity? Are you burning the boats of your life behind you? Have you let it all go completely? Or are you still hanging on to stuff back there and letting it mess with the Spirit in you which is connected to the Spirit from God? Don't ever forget this Scripture, John 14 and 16. As I start to motor here towards the end, John 14 and verse 16. This keeps me pumped, folks. Don't ever forget it. John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever! Forever! He's always there. He's like your shadow. But do you believe it? Do you believe He's there in your darkest moments, in your most troublesome moments? Are you thinking about the Comforter who is right there with you? you got to keep that in mind. He's never going to let you go. Now, we know God is light, right? We want to pray, study, fast, meditate, follow God's laws, be obedient. God is light. 1 John 1, verse 5. Many other occurrences in the Bible where God is light. Listen to what David Bohm, a very famous physicist, says about man. Go back to what I was saying about the observer effect. Again, I'm just throwing some information out there. How it relates, I can't even figure it out right now myself. Here's what David Bohm said that really struck me. One way to conceive of matter is as condensed or frozen light. Now what did I tell you was matter? You're matter. I'm matter. This is matter. Let me say that again. 
One way to conceive of matter is as condensed or frozen light as I pretend to go in slow motion, okay? We know the speed of light is tremendous, right? We know how quickly light moves. We know how many times God is described as light in the Bible. What is the spirit in man? What is the spirit of God? Physicists say we are condensed or frozen light. I don't even know what the implications of that lead to, but it's interesting to contemplate that in this understanding of God's spirit connecting to your spirit and how that connects to your body and healing. And and again, I'm not making any doctrine here. I'm just presenting information that kind of blows my mind when I start thinking about it. It's amazing what's going on down here on planet Earth. Now, as I start to wind things down, I want to kind of give you a big bang at the end here. John chapter 4 and verse 48. It's going to lay out what I'm going to discuss here in my final 10 minutes. John 4 and verse 48. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. What did Jesus know about humanity? We need to see the shiny object. We need to see the big bang. You know, We need to see something happen for a lot of people to believe. And I believe that that has a lot to do, not all, but that has a lot to do with the tremendous miracles that God has put in His Bible. The the miracles of Moses, the miracles of Jesus, the miracles of the early New Testament church, raising people from the dead, clearing leprosy instantaneously. These spontaneous healings, there's a little bit of, of a trace of cancer left, and then it disappears. We're talking about healings in the Bible that are spontaneously complete. Having the blind man see. Anybody heard of any blind men that have seen in in the church history? I, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen anybody rise from the dead, personally. Okay? At least if they've been dead a couple days, for sure. I've heard of some stories where someone comes upon someone who might be dead. Again, we don't know from a scientific perspective if that person may have been dead. But you get what I'm saying here. What's Jesus saying? Some people need to see these things to make them believe. Now, why do I say that in relation to healing? Notice Luke chapter 8, verse 43. Luke 8, verse 43. Luke 8, verse 43. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him, touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, who touched me? Now get the the scene here. There's a crowd of people. There's no social distancing going on here. There's a crowd. And Peter, Peter says, what? Jesus said, who touched me? Peter, when all denied, Peter said, there were many here, Master. There's a multitude and a throng here pressing you. And you're saying, who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody has touched me. Now get this. For I perceive, King, old King James, that virtue has gone out of me. Other translations say that power has gone out of me. The Greek word, where's John? Okay, I'm going to do a Greek word now. Dynamis. Okay? I, I'm, I'm cheating on you. I got a little Greek background. But dynamis left Jesus. Now, there are different Greek words for power, but let me show you something interesting about this Greek word for power here. Okay? This woman had faith, and Jesus felt something. Was Jesus coming to her to heal her? No. She went to him for healing. She had faith. She was all in. She burned the boats. She's going for Jesus. Get what I'm saying? Get what I'm saying? And power left Jesus. Spiritual power. Spirit, whatever it is, folks, I don't, I don't know all about it, okay? But get this. Spiritual power and she was healed. Now, I want you to understand something. I'm going to relate 
to these uh, Brazilian faith healers. When I, I started doing some research on this, I was like, whoa, watch out here. There was a guy in Brazil, his name was John of God. Now, John of God was actually a saint. And John of God was a Brazilian faith healer in Abadiania, Brazil. It's a little small village way out in the hinterland of Brazil, not close to the big city. And over 50 years, this guy was operating. 50 years. So think about it. If he's operating for 50 years, he's selling trinkets, he's selling uh, little bags of uh, spices or, you know, whatever he's selling, books he's selling. This guy made a lot of money over 50 years. If you stay in business for 50 years, that's a hard thing to do. Something was going on there that people believed in this guy. Do you get what I'm saying? Because his story got all over the world, and people from all over the world went to visit this guy. You know if Oprah comes to visit you, you're somebody. Oprah went there and did a show on this guy. Okay? Now, what was going on there? Here's what he said about what was going on. This is what he said, that he channels the spirits of 37 different individuals. Some of them are saints within the Catholic Church, and the Orthodox Church, I'm sure. Some are saints, but some are just doctors and psychiatrists that he's channeling through the power in his body, he says. Okay? Now, listen to what, he do, what you do there when you go. You come in, you get your little uh, room, wherever it is. You can go into the meditation room for hours each day. They feed you all kinds of great foods, juices, vegetables, whole grains. You, what were we talking about today? Okay, they have interaction with you, they talk about you, there's a great coming together, a community feel there, everybody's banding together, we're going to eradicate these diseases in people, and what happens? There are numerous spontaneous healings that have occurred in this environment. This guy will take a little scalpel and scrape your eye, he'll take a little knife and he'll put a cut in your, in your gut, and then put it back together in some way. You can see it on the internet, or on, on YouTube, People in the Philippines do the same thing. This all got going in the 1800s through the spiritism movement. What is spiritism all about? It's about spirits being out there with power. Where's that coming from, folks? Who's the leader in false religion in the world today, folks? Who's getting all these false doctrines out there? Anyway, to make a long story short, John of God was convicted of rape in last December. December of 2019, he was convicted of raping four women. 300 to 600 women have now come forward with some story about John of God messing with them as he was trying to heal them of whatever the disease was. So John of God, folks, is not about God. <laughs> but here's what I want you to get. Something happened there that had people get healed some people there was some kind of power there in whatever was happening whether the people through their faith kick-starting their immune system changing their outlook i'm talking about people who had cancer and they're now in their 90s they've been living 20 to 30 years after they dealt with john of god and they say john of god was their conduit he was the one that got them to this new place. I don't think he was. I think whatever they did in their mind and how they changed their, themselves had something more to do with it. But let me show you a scripture around this in 2 Thessalonians 2.9. Remember what I said about dynamis, the Greek word for power. And I'd like you to turn to 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9 because you're going to find that same Greek word right here also. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9. For you remember, brethren, 2 Thessalonians, Mike, not 1 Thessalonians. Okay, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9 says this. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power, dynamis, same word, same Greek word for power here with Satan, is the same Greek word for power when what came out of Jesus into that woman. Is that a little scary, folks? You don't think there's a devil out there? You don't think this world is fooled by everything that's going on out here today? 
He's in the mix like you would not believe. In everything, with everybody, and even the positive. What appears to be positive, he will go there because he is a great deceiver. What is deception? It's fooling you. It is fooling you, and we are getting fooled in this. That same Greek word, I'm limited on time. If you're taking notes, Luke 10, 19, Revelation 13, 2. Luke 10, 19, Revelation 13, 2. Speak of the power of Satan once again as dynamis, as power like Jesus has. Now, Jesus' power is greater. Scripture tells us that. But there is a power in that spirit and all of his minions working in this world in so many different ways. Now, don't forget 1 Corinthians 8, verse 5, which tells us there are many gods. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 5. Get the sense of what it's saying in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 5. I'm going to read it very quickly. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 5. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. That's a statement. That's not saying maybe. He's saying there are gods out there. They are the gods of Satan and his minions is what it's referring to there. And they've got power. And in Luke 4.34, when Jesus came upon the man who was demon-possessed, Luke 4.34, what did the demon say to him? What do you have to do with us, Son of God? Jesus hadn't revealed who he was yet. Jesus hadn't revealed who he was to people yet. But this demon knew who he was. This demon knows things and has power around things. So don't forget that. Now what I want you to remember is that John 20 and verse 29 says this. John 20 and verse 29. One other scripture here in regard to this. John 20, 29. Jesus said unto them, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, yet have believed. That's what faith is all about, not seeing, yet believing. Now, the last thing I want to say here is what Rediger found in doing the research on this book. He found that in 300 to 350 B.C., there were healing centers in ancient Greece to Asclepius, the Greek god of healing. And you know what was going on in those Greek healing centers? the same things that are going on in those Brazilian healing centers, in those Filipino healing centers, where people come in and rest and relax and meditate and talk to the pagan priest and, do, and eat different type of nutrition. Satan knows things. Demons know things about what's going on. So what do we learn from this? Can God heal? Yes, God can definitely heal. James chapter 5 speaks about that. Other scriptures tell us that. But James chapter 4 also says this. James chapter 4, let me just... When we look at healing scriptures, folks, we need to read them all. And in James chapter 4, before the big scripture on you getting healed, which most people in the Word of Faith movement will use to say, hey, you can heal anybody of anything at any time. What do we see in James chapter 4? Once I get there, James chapter, here we go. James chapter 4, and let me pick it up in verse 14. James 4, verse 14. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not. I'm sorry, that's James chapter 3. James chapter 4, verse 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. 
Another scripture to couple with that is over in Romans 8, 26 and 27, which once again talks about God's Holy Spirit intercessory for you. Romans 8, verses 26 and 27, that God's Spirit can intercede for you, but according to God's will. It says there it can take care of your infirmities, but according to God's will. Don't ever forget that that God is the decider. He's going to make the healing happen and complete it or not. Not us. Not us. We can do more for our immune system. We can do more to stay healthy. But when we're talking about awesome healing, like the Bible describes, it's up to God whether or not He is going to do that. In the end, Claire had cancer come back to her. And... She's now 73. In 2018, there was a resurgence of cancer in her body. I don't know what her situation is right now, but she made it to age 73. And what does it say in Psalm 90, verse 10? That man has 70 to 80 years. Some don't make it to that range. Some make it further. The outer limit is 120, according to your Bible also. And interestingly enough, Anybody who lives long only gets to about 120. Nobody gets beyond that, folks. But the Bible says you got 70 to 80 years, folks. Have you burned your boats? Have you burned your bridges? Are you all in? Because what really matters is not this physical existence. What really matters is eternal life, which is promised to us by Jesus Christ.